So, and so I ended up meeting a girl at a club. We shoot to Detroit, and uh, and she got sick of uh, sick of me. She she no longer want to have sex. She no longer want to party no more. That was boring. Mm. And so I'm sitting around, and I'm like, hey, what are you doing? She says, I'm going to church. Same girl said that. Yeah. Okay. I'm like for what? You know what I mean? Like <laughs> for what? You know? And uh, you know, I was extremely. I was a racist. I was you know the organization I was involved with. It was a extremely racist organization, so it's like, man, that's a white man's trick. Mm -hmm. Get the black man, you know, mm -hmm. caught up, you know what I'm saying? And but she convinced me to go. And uh, and I went. This is the Made to Advance Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Olick. We're here to inspire and equip you for your best future. Well, we've got a great conversation today. My friend Troy Evans is with us, and Troy is a former church planter and lead pastor. He is the author of The Edge of Redemption. He is a ministry consultant, and he's also a co-owner of the apparel company Hustle, Pray, Eat. Troy, it is so good to have you with us today. What up, though? Man, so you're coming all the way from Atlanta, not just to be here. You're here for other reasons, but then fitting us in. Man, I feel honored that you'd uh, take time with us. Oh, no, it's Brian. He said, come, I'm coming. Did it? Did when you got, got back to West Michigan? Did you? Did the cold feel like it just slapped you in the face? Or it's horrible. Was it? It was horrible. What do you got in Atlanta right now? It's like fifty. Oh my goodness, that sounds good, man. Yeah, man, <laughs> it's, it's, it's been sweet. Well, let's go back to early days, and so I know you've probably shared your story a million times over, but I think it would be great for our listeners just to be able to hear a little bit about where you come from. So, just describe some of your yeah, your growing up years. Yeah, so I always say that I was born in Grand Rapids, became a man in Detroit, and lived all over, right? Huh. And so in Grand Rapids, just grew up on the southeast side of town um, where, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, my biological father, you know, which is weird to say these days, but uh, my biological father uh, just uh, wasn't around and... Um, um, my mom and my, my stepfather, they were there, did, did the best they could do, just circumstances and, and life um, won, mm -hmm. you know, and caused me to, to get involved with, uh, with, you know, as you know, a lot of gang activity and, and that kind of stuff. And so um, before, uh, so I left my mom's house when I was 16 okay. um, in pursuit of being an adult, you know, in the hood. And it's got involved with, with, with everything you can imagine, the dope dealing, the, the women, the, the gang banging, and uh, find myself, um, you know, three of my brothers being shot, you know, um, as a result. And uh, I, I got ticked off and wanted mm -hmm. to, you know, ha uh, handle ha handle the world, really. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> and so my, my grandfather... Um, yeah, uh, he, I always say his gun was bigger than mine, mm -hmm. and uh, he sent a threat and just told me it's time for me to go. Too many people were, were getting hurt, and uh, and they escorted me to Georgia. And uh, I went to Georgia, tried to get it right, kind of like that Paul thing. You know, you, you know to do right, you want to do right, but it's just something that's drawing yeah. drawing me to, to the street. And uh, and the guy offered me a position uh, to be to be his bodyguard for a minute. Um, and... Uh, for me, I, I hurt people for free, you know what I'm saying, to, to, to be paid to do it um, was, was, uh, was something. And so I did that for a minute. I wasn't really good at it, um, but, uh, but I, I feel like, you know, it went from us having the fancy meals to hanging out with the girls to we used to ride in this. Uh, we had, uh, we had a, a U-Haul truck used to, to, to deliver. I don't know what he was delivering, but what we were delivering yeah. to this date. But I'm going to the U-Haul truck, go from doing all this fanciness to one day, one night in the U-Haul truck to four nights to end up being several months. I became homeless, living in the back of a U-Haul truck kind of deal. And I got up one day like the big old bad hustler, thug Wood, and go call his mama. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> He's like, yo, I, 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 I need to come home. And yeah. I think that's where God's prevenient grace Meaning, I suck. He's awesome, and I'm yeah. in desperate need of him. Yeah, you know he, you know, started to to make. That's where I think my calling, period, started. Yeah. So then, yeah. How, how'd your mom react when she had you guys stayed in touch up to that point, or was it like she barely? Okay. I, I would, you know, I was, I, I was, I felt like an embarrassment to the family. My family was always like every family got their issues. Yeah. But then they had these issues where you, where you, where your greatest addiction was hurting people. You know what I'm saying? That that wasn't that wasn't. 
yeah, that, that wasn't a thing. And so I, I just stayed, I stayed away. And so I would contact her when I was alive, you know. Yeah. But yeah, it was, it was, it was not that much communication. But she was, she was happy, and she sent me money to catch the longest. Uh, I was in North Carolina, the, the longest bus trip you can ever take from North Carolina to Michigan. <laughs> Do, do not advise. <laughs> <laughs> this is horrible. But yeah, so she, yeah, they were happy to have me come yeah. back. They love me as if I ain't never did nothing wrong, wow. you know, ever since. So, Wow. So what, I mean, you, you moved back because you knew being in Atlanta wasn't, wasn't going where you wanted to go. But right. then you had some pretty significant life changes along the way mm-hmm. as far as spiritually and otherwise. So yeah. what, tell me about those. So I um, ended up coming back to Grand Rapids and um, make a, Short it was just it was just too thick still. It was not enough time in between. A lot of you know, you know, you have a lot of people out to hurt you, and you're trying to hurt a lot of people. It, it, that don't go away, but on on its own. Mm-hmm. And so, I ended up uh, just, it was just too much. And so I ended up look, uh, meeting a girl at a club. We shoot to Detroit, and uh, and she got sick of uh, sick of me. She she no longer want to have sex. She no longer want to party no more. That was boring. Hmm. And so I'm sitting around and I'm like, "What are you doing?" She's like, "I'm going to church." I'm like, "Same girl said that?" Yeah. Okay. I'm like for what? You know what I mean? <laughs> like for what? You know? And uh, you know, I was extremely. I was a racist. I was you know the organization I was involved with was was a was extremely racist organization. So it's like, man, that's a white man's trick. Mm-hmm. Get the black man, you know, mm-hmm. caught up. You know what I'm saying? And but she convinced me to go. And uh, and I went, and it was a multi-ethnic church, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it was just like it was a very strange situation. Yeah. And uh, but these people were loving, so I, I felt like somebody lied somewhere along the way. Mm. And that same day, I surrendered. I surrendered to the Lord. Wow. Um, and she did too. She she recommended her life. Wow. And she's my wife for uh, twenty. It's, Eight years. Later. Oh my goodness, that is a great. I didn't realize that was yeah. like she, she was. It was that, Dawn. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah oh my yeah. gosh, that's amazing. Absolutely. So, how long you you eventually become a pastor? But what what, what led to you starting to con- consider being a pastor? Yeah. How did that even happen? So the church I was a part of it was a uh, it was like fifteen thousand people or something. So it was a big church in yeah. Redford, and then I uh, it was just too much for me. It was outside the hood. I twitched when I'm not in the hood too long, and so I was like, oh, I got to go. So we shot to the hood. Yeah, you know what I'm saying to a, a smaller you know smaller church. It was like six hundred people, and uh, and then that pastor, it was like this dude was. He wasn't scared of me, you know what I mean. I was still rough around yeah. the edges. He wasn't. He had no, literally zero fear of, of you know, saying saying what it was. I needed that, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying. Um, <clears throat> and uh, and and he didn't he didn't mind rolling his sleeves up hmm. to get in the dirt, you know what I'm saying. He what was, that look like when you when you say that? A literal in a literal sense. So he he was like number three guy in Blue Cross Blue Shield. So mm-hmm. he's this corporate beast, um, and he was he was over the. Um, Detroit Urban League. He was the president of Detroit Urban League. So he was this corporate beast, but yeah. at the same time, he get off. He got on his tie. He, he, he walking in. He's taking off his tie. He rolling his sleeves up. Yeah. And we digging ditches. Huh. And I'm coming, you know, to, you know, and he like, get on over here. Yeah. This is this is what real ministers do. You know, uh, this is what they do, and that's what that's what I got out of it. Is mm-hmm. that and so really cut my teeth on ministry, and I would say my calling was a dude. He came over to, to teach. And I'm not, you know me, man. I'm not, you know, I'm me. One thought, I ain't changed since we met. Yeah. I'm just, I'm not. No one in their right mind would come up and be like, oh yeah, you're gonna be a pastor. <laughs> I don't, I don't, you know, nothing yeah. about me would say that. And he, he just stopped. He was in the middle. He was after church. He was up there. And he just stopped everything. It yeah. wasn't like a church service. He just, he just stopped. Every, you know, the pastors hanging out at the pulpit area. I'm walking. I'm just walking. He stopped. Everybody stop. You. I mean, literally, it was like. And he was just—he he laid it out and just told me. And from there, that's when I—I I embraced the call hmm. um, to to uh, change my life, which was just to be to, to, to serve people. So you didn't at that point. I mean, when, was he literally saying, "I see a call to ministry as like a vocation in your life," or was it? I mean, what, what what you know when that? What was that calling exactly? Yeah, to? yeah. He 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 said I was called to to pastor. He didn't say the normal because you can. You could look at me and be like, yeah, this dude is from around the way. I, I expect that. Like, yeah, you're going to reach the people in the hood. You're going to do I would expect that. 
But no, it was like you were called to teach. Mm. You were, and I was falling in love with words. I didn't learn to read until I was, in my, as you know, until I was about 21. Yeah. And so I, you know, I'm learning to to put words together and like to, and I'm, I'm starting to love words. Wow. And I'm digging deep, really deep into words and understanding the English language and the Aramaic, you know, Hebrew, just really diving deep. Mm. And uh, he didn't know that, you know what I'm saying? And he was just like, you're going to be teaching. You're not, you're not just going to gonna be able to translate the word. To the, and it's just like all that. And yeah. so that, that's what I embraced. Yeah. That was part one. Part two, the pastor of that church got up and said, yo, if y'all going to wait for me to die, it's another different time. But he said, if you're going to wait for me to die before you think you're going to get up here and preach and do your ministry, this ain't your place for ministry. You better go find it. Hmm. And then that's when I left. Um, I think it was John Eldridge that said that your greatest hurt often comes from your, from, uh, your greatest passion often comes from your deepest hurt. Mm. And uh, for me, it was just, I went to a homeless shelter and I planted a church there, you know. Okay. That was where I first, I just went and started pastoring. Yeah. They ain't, go, ain't going nowhere. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it just, they needed, and so that's where we, and that's where the. Still uh, in Detroit. Yeah, still in Detroit. Okay. Uh, it was called Christ Like Outreach Ministry. Wow. So what led then, you, you end up back in Grand Rapids yep. and uh, what led to the edge. And, and so, yeah. I mean, in some ways, like the, the the ministry at the homeless shelter was like, in a sense, your first church planning experience. Yes. I'm guessing it was a little bit less formal than oh, like, yeah. a, oh, <laughs> you know, we've I got... Bodyguards, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's... So it's uh, so that's different than uh, probably when you came out to GR. Yeah. But what, what, what was the journey like then? So, to, yeah, that's a good question. Um. So I ended up, um, um, in between me coming to, giving my life to Christ and me leaving Detroit, Yeah, I, I'm fully aware that, that I, I have zero to offer, um, you know, and, and uh, zero. You know what I'm saying? God is he, he's just dope like that, man. I, I don't, it doesn't make sense to me. Mm-hmm. It still doesn't. But literally, he, um, he gave me um, some people. He gave me a pastor. He gave me a business owner. He gave me an IT engineer. By God's grace, I became all of them. You mm-hmm. know, again, I, I I barely could read the stuff, but He allowed me to pass tests. Um, at the time, Microsoft tests that nobody was passing. Mm-hmm. You know, it was just it was a new coming to MCSC. It was a new thing in mm-hmm. technology, and by God's grace, I became one, which He allowed me to go in and make more money than a human should make. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, so with that, I was in the IT field. Then I opened my own IT company. Yeah, um, and doing all that stuff. Then I, I, I was visiting. Uh, people were, were having me come to Grand Rapids to visit, yeah. to speak at churches and stuff like that. Um, and these dudes, these pastors were scared of these cats on the block, you know. And um, one time I remember, um, I, always, I always come with somebody. I just That's how I roll. But, um, um, so I had my, had my guys with me. And uh, I remember I preached and then pastor, it was a big glass. And there was these dudes out here shooting dice. <clears throat> they were across the street at this time. But he said, hey, those guys right there, they shoot dice on our on the porch of the church. You should, you should go out there and talk to them. Mm. And I'm like, I'm looking back like, you cowards? I mean, I, that's just that's just me. Yeah, you know? Especially right. then, I, I was, um, you know, I'm, I've gotten a little bit more refined since then. <laughs> a little bit. But yeah. I'm just like, what's up? Like, I said, yeah. why y'all not going out here talking to these cats? And yeah. I just got frustrated. Took my guy when we went out there. I was like, what's up? I mean, y'all can't be shooting Dice on the church stoop. Mm-hmm. Before I know it, I know the uncle, da, 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 all this stuff. We start yeah. talking. So come on, man. Just don't. I, I ain't, I'm not proud. I'm, hey, do your thing across the street. Don't shoot at this church. Yeah. We good? We good. And it, it was just like that. And I think in that moment was um, this, the, the, the third phase of, of the calling, I think, where, where I felt like I can't keep on complaining about these dudes. Hmm. I, done, I done tore the city up. There were There was no... There were no gangs on the side of the state until we until we started doing what we do. They, they didn't exist at the level until we started doing what we do. So I took a part in um, in destroying it. So why couldn't I come back and build it? So that's what we decided to do. My wife and I we came back to Grand Rapids to 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 plant to to plant the second church, yeah. um, which we called um, it was called Knowledge of Truth, Church of God in Christ. Okay. So even then, that wasn't the edge yet. No. Oh, okay, gotcha. I didn't realize there was another. I mean, it's funny. I know you've had multiple mm-hmm. church plants, but I didn't realize how many came. But I guess that so was the edge. What number in three? Tr- three. Number three. Okay, gotcha. We did four total, but the church edge was three. Okay, gotcha. That I, that I pastored. Mm-hmm. It, it's cool how, again, even for planting that church, it came in some ways out of an, again, an ache because yeah. you saw the hurt 
in the community that in some ways you'd been part of. And now you're like, I feel like there's an ache in me to do something about that, to address, to address damage that's been done. And, and so you planted the church. So how, how long before that church then to the edge? That was a, that was a, I think probably like a three, four year run Okay. before um, I, we were doing things, the church, we were never a big church. I don't, I don't, I, I can think I can safely say I don't think God has called me to pastor. I don't think I can do it, mm-hmm. right? I think He He gives me a small group and then let me let me let me make let me let me pour lighter food on on the, on the Stephen Malcolms, right? Who already got a set of fire in them. Mm-hmm. Um, they just they're trying to find their way and then say, "Oh, let me just get you." And so that's what happened with this church. And it was just it was this family church that's doing making major waves, you know, in terms of reaching the community for Jesus. Um, but then my nephew was murdered. I was already on the, on the fence of like, so what do we do next? My nephew was murdered, and I just it was just me. I know better now, but it was me on my island, just feeling like, man, here go these lanes, pastors again. Mm-hmm. Where my where my nephew gonna go? Where he's gonna be able to sit on somebody's deacon board? Where they going their assimilation process does not include him. Mm-hmm. He's not. He's nowhere. He he doesn't fit the bill, no way, shape, or form. I don't fit the bill mm-hmm. if I don't throw my resume on the table, right? And so it's just like. I said, I'm done with it. I don't want to be a part of this garbage, quite frankly. And then I went, I went, I went hibernate. You know, I went, I went quiet. You know, and I told my wife we're going, we could do better by ourselves. I told everybody, you know, we got two weeks to find another church. And it, it uh, and we went home. And I, I said, I do, I do Bible, I can do bad by myself. I don't mm-hmm. need a church infrastructure to be. I don't need that. And yeah. so, so we went and we started doing house church. We were living in Kentwood at the time. Okay. And then my my wife was again. We started going to church. She's a, she, I mean, she she's problem. You, you're a blessed man. I she, mean, it sounds like she has pretty uh, key roles here. <laughs> <laughs> she's a troublemaker. That's what she is. <laughs> so yeah, seriously, she started going to church, and yeah. she, she was going to this church called Kentwood Community Church. Oh yeah, I know Kentwood. Right, and she ended up talking to the dude and uh, Wayne. I know, find out later, and uh, uh, you know Wayne. Like so, it's like he make you feel real special. But really, he got a deck of cards with different people's <laughs> name on it. And in the moment, he yeah. just pulled that card out. And like, you know, and now you become like, he just, I'm like, oh, he really cares about me. Uh-huh. And, but she set me up, you know, and then he he talked to me and we, we started. But one of the things I'll say, and I got I always say this, is like, um, is that they, they, they allowed me to heal. Because mm. Kyle was the outreach pastor, as you know, and then Wayne was the lead pastor. And, uh, and, and I have three talents. I suck at 3,217 things last uh-huh. time I counted, but I'm, I'm sticking good at three things. Yeah. I'm, I'm sticking good at them. They knew what they were. Yeah. You know, my professional career, my ministry career, they knew like I, I, they didn't exploit that. And everything I was good at, they needed. Huh. They, need, they needed to be better at what youth engagement. What were the three things? Youth engagement, like okay. engaging, empowering youth, and yeah. deploying them to do crazy stuff for mm-hmm. Jesus. You know, it's what I what we do. Strategic planning. I'm a strategist. I sucked as an engineer. Uh-huh. I, I don't want to fix anything if you paid me. When they pay me well to do it. <laughs> I'm a strategist. Okay. You're here. You need to get here. And here's strategic steps to get there. How do you measure it? What do you need? Who do, who do you need to get it done? That's what I do. Mm-hmm. You know, and then outreach, community engagement. Okay. They needed all of those. Yeah. And so they didn't exploit that. They like, just help, let me heal. Kept on meeting with me. Kept on meeting with me. Never asked me to get in ministry. Mm-hmm. I came in and said, hey, I'm here. I need to do something. Yeah. And Kyle finally gave me some work to do. I did an a audit of their of their outreach ministry. And then it was a Mark Gorvette. Yeah. The Mark Gorvette conversation that Kyle and I was going to talk. Actually, Kyle and I were going to plant a church together. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Wow. He, he was feeling the call to be a lead pastor. Okay. And he, we went to go talk to Mark about, and I said, no, nah, I'm saying I don't want to be no pastor. Uh-huh. I said, now if you do it, I'll rock with you. I'll do what you do here for KCC. I'll do that with you. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll reach cats, you know, on the block. And he said, okay, let's go. Bro, we sit in the middle of a conversation at Applebee's. He's talking. He said, Troy, so tell Mark what you were dreaming about. Huh. And that's where the, the at least the, the conversation about the edge came up. Wasn't no, called okay. the edge then, but. Wow. Was Mark, uh, was, well, let me say a couple things real yeah. quick. One, I think it's really cool. And good for younger leaders to hear, like, you've already said, hey, you know, there's a lot of things you're not good at, yeah. and you knew that there are a few things that you are good at. And that's just a good thing to just, just to be dialed into for folks. I mean, there's so much of a pressure. You see this person's good at that, and this yeah. person's good at this thing over there, and y- you feel like a pressure sometimes. You got to be all those things that all those people yeah. are. And I love that you just, you know, these are my three things. But the other thing I think that you said that was so good was when you were you were saying, 
um, I don't think I'm called to be necessarily this big, large church pastor. Mm-hmm. I'm called for a certain size. And again, it's just one of those places. I think we all have our own limitations. Yeah, man. And sometimes we yeah. try to fight them. And I see that. Uh. I see that in myself, where I like. There's an idea. Somehow I got into my head. It's my, whether it's reading a book or looking at somebody else. It's almost always from comparison mm-hmm. that I think I need to be this or that. And and you know what? God gives you your limitation, and as long as you're operating within it, that's actually a blessing Facts. to just make peace with it. And and totally so I really agree. I just appreciate that. You know, you were able to. That's a good example for. For all of us to say, hey, let's make peace with. There's some things we're good at. There's some things we're gonna yeah. real be, really be successful at, and other things we just got to be cool. We're, we're, we got a limitation there. Unfortunately, it came from a lot of sweat and failing, you mm-hmm. know, and and really learning. I know it's, I think it's an overused term, but failing forward. Mm-hmm. But really doing that, like yo, like yeah. embracing that, yo, maybe I suck at this, uh-huh. and maybe God's okay with that. Maybe that's why it's a body jointly fit together. Yeah. He's better at it. Why don't I get him to do that? Yeah. And then that doesn't that doesn't that doesn't hinder my uh, my my manhood, right? Because you know, that's what it hits. It's yeah. Like, oh, man, I should be able to do everything, right? Nah, yeah, I shouldn't do everything. So. Yeah. So so uh, how did Mark react? You start talking about your heart. Yeah. And at that point, it's not like oh, I want to plant a church that's called the Edge, and it's just just probably a heart for Raw. a passion yeah. of how you want to make a difference. It does Mark's. Does Mark hear you share and say it feels like you got a church in you or what what like what yeah. what happened next? He you know you know Mark's key word is like, let's dream some more, right? Okay. Um but to to for me to be able to just tell somebody raw dog how my emotion, I'm really settled right now, mm. but I'm off I'm 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 coming off my nephew being brutally murdered. Still don't know who killed him mm. to date and 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 like I don't have a church and from my perspective at the time, that I can take him and say, you don't have to go to uncle's church. Just go to this church. They mm. will love you. Yeah. They will help you. They won't teach you like a project. They will they'll teach you like a person. And then they will, will pull those the things out of you that God has created you to be and pull light of fluid. I, I didn't have that as refined. I could just I just told him what it was. How, I told him about my hurt more than I did anything. Mm-hmm. This is what I this is what I'm feeling, and we need to respond to that it's gap analysis, so to speak. Yeah. And saying this is a gap, and here it is. So how do we go after? That, that's what I feel like I'm called to do. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you want to call it a church. You call it what you want to. I really don't care. Yeah. But this is, I want to do that. You know what I'm saying? Um, I'm going re- to reach this demographic. I didn't use that exact language, but I'm saying I want to reach mm-hmm. the demographic. And here's why. But I'm also share, share my hair, my hurt. And Mark was just like, he just started smiling. He's like, tell me more. And, you know, and, I, and, and we just kept on meeting and meeting and meeting. And then, then, then I met you. How long, was the, the, how long was the gap between that conversation and like when the edge actually launched, is this years or is this months nah, or what is this? That would have been like a a, a nine month conversation, I would say. Okay. Of uh, the, the traditional church planting process, as you well know, you know, you're going and you're developing, a, you know, the process, developing your proposal and all that stuff. If it was all rolled into this whole big old thing, them trying to get to know me, mm-hmm. uh, and then and 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 it's such a unique ministry mm-hmm. for. Any denomination, but definitely for the for the Wesleyan Church at the time to do a church like that was was just was rare. Yeah, yeah, and still, I mean, for any ch- anybody anywhere to do a church mm-hmm. like that, the Edge was a like a pioneering model. Maybe you should just share a little bit about that. Like, what made the Edge yeah. so unique? I think the unique part on on externally would be that we use hip hop as our primary. Um, genre mm-hmm. for worship. That's the exterior. But I think internally what was unique about it is that we live by four principles that would be contextualized for the urban context, which mm. is evangelism, discipleship, spiritual growth, and holistic empowerment. And we mean that. Mm-hmm. We mean that all shrink wrapped in holiness. Mm-hmm. You know, and and um we meant that, but it was like, well then how do we evangelize the the urban hip hop culture, though, we really need to know how to do that, and so we have to throw away everything, and, and then, especially yeah. to, to date, there's not a lot of material that would say, "Right, you, this is how you, uh, this is how you evangelize, this is how you go after, engage, not only the urban context, mm-hmm. but not only, but a subculture inside of a subculture. This is how you do that. <clears throat> so that's what 
Uh, I forget the question, but that's whatever. Yeah, that well, that's what really set the edge apart as a distinctive, yeah, 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 just yeah, a yeah. yeah, distinctive community. Yep. And st- I mean, still today, I, and this is probably part of part of why you're doing ministry consulting. I know it's not limited to just churches like the Edge, no, but the reality not. is, there's not a lot of people if you're trying to do something as progressive as as um, what the Edge was. There's just yep. not a lot of people you can talk to still on a national level. I got to think it's. Um, would you is that is it a fairly small number on a national? Yeah, it's, level? A, it's a small number. Yeah. I you know we're still trying to get good numbers. I think the last time we counted in a, a few years ago with uh, with Urban D um, years back, I think we had like 10, 15 churches in the world that we knew that do what yeah. we do at the um, at the core. That mm-hmm. it's not just the music; it is culture, mm-hmm. which is which includes all everything is truly. Truly, a cultural experience more than just oh yeah they're gonna do a song. It's yeah. like no no no, it's everything that we do ran right. through the grid of, of hip hop. Which I think is, is, is important to mention that I'm not talking about this lame music. You know what I'm saying? You're not both old enough to know. I'm not talking about that, right? Yeah. It's like I'm saying the pillars of hip hop, and I, I just reconcile it with scripture. Like yo, the pillars of hip hop is love, peace, unity, and having fun. Since African Bambada put a put a name to it. Just its origin, mm-hmm. love, happiness, unity, and having fun. Like, why in the world can't the church be about that? Yeah, <laughs> right. Why wouldn't we want to step into that? Oh, yeah. because we don't like the music. Yeah, we don't understand it. We, it ain't going nowhere. I'm fifty some years old, and I'm not wearing a, a costume. I was born in this. Mm-hmm. You know, it's cool with uh, talking to Stephen. Malcolm was by the time he came to the edge, he said he had already had like three different guys say to him, you got to check out the edge. You got to check out mm. the edge. You got to come to this church. And I just, I thought, I mean, what a cool, uh, a cool kind of witness that the vibe already in the community is such that he's hearing it multiple times and he keeps hearing more, more people say, oh, I, I got to get to that. I got to get to that. So it's just, uh, yeah. I mean, it shows you were, you were speaking the language you needed, you needed to speak that yep. he's hearing it that many times from people saying positive things about their experience awesome the and seeing guys. I mean, I loved hearing him talk about just seeing guys that, you know, he's, they were up to all kinds of crazy and all mm-hmm. of a sudden they're, Mm-hmm. They're living a different way, and he's like, "Oh, I, I knew what I knew what you used to be like. What's Straight all up. this about?" And then they're saying, "Yeah, you got to come, you know, come to the edge." Oh, it's so good, so good. It was just, uh, I don't know. I was, I was obviously around a little bit for the early days, and uh, it was fun to just uh, kind of do a tour, tour backwards in time, and, yeah. and hear those life change stories. Now, uh, pastoring, no matter where you're at, mm-hmm. comes with some great joys and also some some big challenges, and. Uh, when you're leading a church like The Edge, there's probably, in some ways, some unique joys and some unique challenges. But when you look back, I mean, what, what do you look at as, wow, these are some of my favorite memories from pastoring The Edge, and then, and you're retired from pastoring now, mm-hmm. a lot of coaching, and all, you got your hands in all kinds of pots. We'll maybe mm-hmm. talk about some of those later. But um, yeah, when you look back at Pastoring The Edge, what do you look at? We'll start with some of the, the, the memories and moments that to you are your most favorite yeah, man. Favorite ones. It would be, to me, I, you know, uh, my my passion is 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 young men. You know, to see young men uh, have have dudes that can um, that's willing to stop being lame and and make them the most important thing in the room. Make who you're saying make, making that older men make younger men the most important gotcha. people in the room yeah. versus me, me, mine, mine, and yeah. my family. Yeah. Um, and then so for me, it's really seeing a young cat go from here to there. Mm-hmm. Um, it's to see them. I know that they're operating from uh, from a you know search institute. They have this thing of of, of development. You know um, these four developmental assets that a person should have to be successful. But mm-hmm. well, they're operating at negative three hundred. Mm-hmm. They didn't have none of that stuff invested. Yeah. So just to get them at baseline, mm-hmm. that that that's the to me is just that. Oh, you don't want to shoot nobody no more. Uh-huh. That's dope. Yeah, you know, breakthrough. You know, what I'm saying you're not smashing chicks left and right. Uh huh. You know more. You know that is like a break. Oh no, he shouldn't be like he he filled the Holy Spirit. Okay, okay, so you say that, but then when you when you raised in the basement with a pimp. Mm-hmm. Or you you raised by you know saying you know you got strippers all around you got this and that and the other and everybody's macking women everybody got multiple women and you're just supposed to be oh you're supposed to just 
as supposed to, no, no, I am, I am ecstatic when I see that that is the thing that kept me going yeah. and still keeps me going when I can see those, that, those are big wins. To see um, dreams. So we, we, we decided early on that we we're going to take our money and, and think that yourself and the Getty just over the years has been invest, investment in the ace, but we, nobody liked, you know, you know it, it was difficult to explain to finance people our budget. Because it's like, no, I'm going to buy lots of pizza. You're not going to like my $7,000 in pizza I bought this year. <laughs> You're just not going to like it. Yeah. Because you got cats like Mike who's coming here to get food. It's the only place he's eating to take back to his, to his grandfather who has, who has a dementia that he's been raising since he was 12. Mm -hmm. This is only food. He got a pack of meat at home. That's it. And then and the, the pizza that he gets here. To be able to see those kind of dudes have dreams and ideas. And girls, like ideas. And then we're able to help them. To say, like, there's no way in the world you would have gone to college. There's no way in the world if we would have made those literally three trips a year yeah. to just help you to dream again. There's no way in the world that you would have become a producer or, or you're in a corporate setting. You're, you're doing these things if there wasn't a church that became your surrogate mm -hmm. father. That's so good. So beautiful. And that's where I, I remember Stephen talking about when you put the studio in that was it, it's actually was in the church, right? That, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's just such a great and progressive idea to say, hey, we're going to put the equipment right here. And it's not just going to be for the staff or for church services or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's going to be for people to, to, to learn, to grow, to practice, to develop. I mean, he, if that wouldn't have been in, the pla in, no. in place, I don't know if he would have become if yeah. he would have become who he is today because no, you, you helped not. pave the way for that, gave him opportunities. And, and even greater things, like, it's like, yo, at the end of the day, uh, we don't separate, you know, I teach community development stuff, you know, CTDA stuff. I, I really do. I want a trainer, so I get it. Mm -hmm. But we don't separate that. It's like, I want Jesus to get all the credit uh -huh. and to be housed in the church. Yeah. To say that, forget what you heard about the church. The church is not just takers, takers, takers. You know, we're, we're givers, you know. And to, to for a Stephen and others like Stephen to be able yeah. to see like, no, let's invest in you. I, they know how much. It, I told them how much it cost. Mm -hmm. I would tell them what it costs to build a room inside of a room, a studio, right? And what, it, what I want them to know like, and it's yours. Mm -hmm. What do you want to call it? Yeah. Give them ownership. You know what I'm saying? And build it. Build a whole basement for a dance school so that Mark can dance. You know, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, uh, B. Cole, you know, he's he done, you know, work for Crowder to his Grammy. He got a Grammy for uh, NF. And, you know, he, he didn't even have a, he, he had a little keyboard. And, but we so, bought him a studio. Is that right? So that's where but, he started. Oh, my. He's still, I, I, I follow him on social. Mm -hmm. And I, we've never met, but um, I see his work and I love, and it, and he's so transparent on, his, on social. Yeah, oh, too, yeah. He's, just, yeah, was, I love his. Yeah, so anyway, but that's that's cool. Beacon, I didn't know. right? So Beacon. Yeah. Beacon, right now, like, what? Three, three billion streams or something like Is that, that right? doing oh stuff gosh, he's doing. Crazy. And, and he got a song. Was it? It's Beacon's song that's on uh, the beginning of Creed, right? I yeah. Think oh, yeah. It's a, for the trailer for Creed. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and that's not, even, that's not even his big big one. Like, yeah. You know what I'm saying? But too, but when he came, you know, he I, I couldn't stand the way he rapped. Huh. You know what I'm saying? I told him, like, we need to work on that. Let's, yeah. get, let's get it cracking. But giving him opportunity to lead and yeah. but just to watch him do what he's doing. Yeah. It's like, man, in terms of that's what I, that, that's what gets yeah. me up every morning. That's amazing. I know, I know you'd be the first one to say God gets all the glory, but uh, man, I just, um, I can't, I can't say how, how encouraging it is. And just, uh, I feel like it's been a big honor. We've had one little, and Getty has had one little small part of just encouragement mm -hmm. along the way, but it's, uh, I just feel like it's been such an honor to see you do, you do you and lead, lead ministry and build into lives. And it's just amazing. And all these guys and many that, you know, won't have names that people recognize, mm -hmm are all uh, just the fruit of a long, a long run of faithful ministry. So I just, man, I salute and you. And I say too, man, like it's, it was, you know, what we were talking about was so out the box to have, you know, so Brian was my church planning coach, you know. Uh, I don't know what I was doing. I, there's nothing yeah. about me qualified to be a church planning <laughs> yeah, right. coach, but. <laughs> but like, you know, it was, it was, it was, again, it was, it was, to me, it was just like this handoff from Wayne to Mark. Yeah. You know, to, to, to you, to there was no Phil Struckmeyer in there. Mm -hmm. There was nobody saying no. Nobody was saying, oh, you're just crazy. Yeah. You're asking good questions and then helping guide them, but it was just like continue, like, you know, pouring lighter fluid on it. I think that. So I, I'm yeah. beyond thankful for that. So. Yeah, thanks. When you think about, when you think about church planning days and just some of the challenges, Jeez. what, uh, what comes to mind as some of the things that were like, this was just, this was hard. Yeah. I think, you know, obviously the money part for every church plan, every church is mm -hmm. always hard. 
Um, it just, it just, I think it was having worked with so many types of churches and different sizes. This, I mean, the uh, the subculture of a subculture gets even more difficult mm-hmm. because sustainability. We're still, we're still in beta with this. And so we didn't really know what sustainability looks like yeah. from a financial standpoint. And so that, that's always been hard. You know, we started off with 80% of our funding coming from the outside to now I think we're about like 50%, you know, okay. 15 years later, which is a growth, mm-hmm. you know, but, uh, but when you, when you are, when you, when, when you're, when Tank becomes one of the older people in the, in the church, yeah. what do you expect? Yeah. And that will forever, because the idea is that we bring them in, we sit them down, we raise them up, we send them out. We really send them out. Mm-hmm. So then the idea is like, oh, we start all the way over every two years. Yeah. So then you, oh, we're back to 80%. Oh, <laughs> you know, in terms of, let's get some more teenagers or whatever. So that's always been a challenge. And God is, man, he's, he's awesome. He's, he's allowed us to, to, to stay alive. You know, you, you make me great. Well, it's funny because we'll make sometimes the same point about our church because seventy-five uh, percent of the church is under the age of forty, yeah. and uh, the largest age group is eighteen to, to twenty-nine. Yeah, and so it's funny because when you compare our church to churches like ours, um, it, we're pretty young, yeah. and that affects things on the financial side. It does, and uh, and so on the one hand, sometimes I'm like, man. It's great having young people, but uh, Man, it's, you it's, feel it. You feel it a little bit budget, but then I'll talk to you, and I'm like, you know what? How about I just stay thankful? <laughs> <laughs> we Listen. we made a decision, though. I mean, and this is this, this again when you're when you have that mentality of, hey, it's not just more for us. It's about sending out. Yeah. When it comes to people, resources, Man. all that. Right from the beginning, I know. we said we're going to take 25% of our budget. And that's yeah. still the case yeah. today. We're oh, hoping on, we man. can get beyond that. We're, we're hoping we can be, yes. get beyond 25%. That's our, our prayer and, and uh, what I remember a graphic towards. y'all used to have. It was like these three, yeah. like these things. And part of it was that sending and giving and giving significant amounts, for, including the edge, for churches, to, for people to do stuff. Yeah. I would say the, the other struggle, just I'm just, you know, I'll just yeah, keep it a buck, it. man. It's just like... I'm just I'm just tired of wishy washy Christians. Man. Yeah, you know when I was banging, it's a, it's a word called false flagging. I'm sorry, I'm just I'm so far removed from it. Mm-hmm. But I was born in a I was I was I was a leader. I was raised. It's in my fiber of who I am, and I just take out the meat and spit out the bones of mm-hmm. everything. Mm-hmm. And the meat was I don't understand. I don't know what it feels like to date to put my hat to the right. Because I never, we never did that. Mm-hmm. We never passed drinks to the right. We passed to the left. I don't know what it, I don't know. I know. I know. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't know what it. I don't I, internally. I don't know what it feels like. Mm-hmm. And the same. I don't understand Christians. Uh, pray for me. I'm just like boss up, man. Wishy washy, soft. That's been the hard part. It's mm-hmm. like either, you don't have to be a Christian. Yeah. This, this is, you do not have to be, I'm that pastor, like, do something else because you're a bad representation of the king. Mm-hmm. I'm a part of this body, and I don't false flag. You don't have to be a Christian. Either you are, and that is having the attributes of Christ. Yeah. What do those look like? What does paracletos and dwelling spirit look like with spirit fingers? Mm-hmm. What does that look like? If that, that is the most, that has been the most thing. It's like, bruh, why do you wait till you're a Christian to start smoking weed? I'm tired of Christians smoking weed. Mm-hmm. That's probably that's that's drugs and sex and I'm just tired of it. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. That you actually I'm, that's been my frustration. It's like yeah. you you seen what God has done in you, for you, and through you, and you land back here. Mm-hmm. You know better. You you ought to do better. That that's the most frustrating thing. You see, you know where I come from. Right. You know you know that I'm fighting. I I I. I it's an addiction that's deep in my soul to hurt people, and I'm stinking good at it. But you see me fight it and not hurt a soul mm-hmm. in 28 years. Don't tell me what you can't do. Don't tell me what you can't, what, what's not possible, man. No, you're not fighting. That is my that is my biggest. Yeah, I'm sorry, man. That that's it. How do you keep? I, so I, I mean, I think about this all the time, and it is. It's it's when when you see people. I, I it breaks my heart when I see people who are they know better and they're. They're messing up their own lives, and then they know better, and it's uh, they're messing up other people's lives. And on top of all of that, it gives the church a bad reputation right when there's just when there's just straight up. I know I know I'm supposed to be walking this way, and I'm I'm going a different way. And yet, I'm called to still walk yeah, and love love absolutely. those people and be patient with them. And I think of like I think of First Corinthians. I mean, I, I was thinking about doing a teaching series through First Corinthians because 
there was so much crazy in that church. Yeah. And they knew better. I <laughs> yeah. mean, it was, p- people are sleeping with people yeah. that they're related to. Yeah, I man. mean, it was Wild. It was crazy. And and I think about what it had been like to be Paul, and I f- those would be the moments to me. I, I, I'd i see that stuff, and I feel like I'd be tempted to be like, you know what? I quit. I'm yeah. out, because this is clearly yeah. what I'm doing is not working. So how did you how do you stay in it when you see when you see those, these kinds of things that are so disheartening, frustrating, yeah. angering? How do you stay in it and not just stay in it, but how do you stay in a posture where somehow you're still loving and not just mad? Right. Yeah. 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 Right. And I think that's that goes back to me um, never forgetting that I suck and God's awesome and I'm mm-hmm. in desperate need of Him. Because of that, I think that helps me to stay balanced and yeah. say, like, the, the only reason why I'm not doing, you know, sex in and drinking and, and hurting people is because of God's God's love for me. And that's just not, not a cliche. It's I know because I love every ounce of the last three things I said to you. Yeah. I, I loved them. And uh, and I may still have a, uh, I still may have a love for them. Mm-hmm. You get what I'm saying? And it's just that it's only him standing there. Yeah. That's the only thing because then I, I, I shake out of my anger shake out of my lack of understanding and then say okay let's let's let me get myself together mm-hmm. and let's get back on track yeah and that that's the and that's my own my only that's my own so in another way where i'll be able to to continue to get on that track 10 15 times with the same yeah. person i think of uh pete Cazero first pointed this out but the the different places where the apostle paul talks about his own brokenness and mm. You know, at one point, and I'm going to mess this up, but at one point, you know, it talks about being the chief of sinners and mm. then the worst of all and all these different self descriptors yeah, that are really pretty negative in nature. And he, he lined them up on what we believe is the best chronology of Paul's writings. And he's like, and, and Pete pointed out that the one that Paul probably said the latest in life was actually the most severe about himself. I don't know if it was the chief of all sinners because I can't remember which one, mm-hmm. which descriptor was the was the most um, was or which which the wording was the most severe, but but the point he was making was it was like while Paul was on the one on the one hand doing ministry, trying to encourage people, mm-hmm. getting more in touch with the love of God, yeah, it was also like as he's growing, he's more in touch with his own brokenness, yeah, man, more humbled before yeah, his man. own weakness, and. Uh, Sheesh. And I, I wonder if that's how I wonder if that's how Paul kept that sense of humility. I mean, yeah. and it, of course, there, I, as even as we're talking now, I'm thinking about the thorn in the flesh, where where he he said, "God, would you take this away?" And and God said, "No." So it must be because Paul was a brilliant man. He was an accomplished man. Yeah. He was before he was a Christian. He was clearly after he's a Christian. And uh, when you're you, when you've got that kind of gifting and whatnot, I mean, I think. I think God knew this man could be prone towards pride. I must so say, yeah, you can. Somehow Paul stayed dialed in with his weakness. Yeah. And I think you have to, I think you, I think any leader is going to be called a, a spiritual leader, a, a, a Christ-following leader has to stay in touch with that. Somehow, I don't know, mm-hmm. you know, don't go jumping in no fires, mm-hmm. but somehow stay in tune and stay, stay uh, to remember because for my children, and we, we get ticked off of what they're doing and or, or, or those we love and then those we love that we're discipling and the congregations we're leading and the organizations we're leading because it will bring you back to, to like, reality. Like, mm-hmm. man, you was there, too, yeah. in your own way. And yeah. So that's, for me, that's, that's what I, I stay in touch with my own um, humanity, really. Yeah, that makes sense. You've been married for 20 20- you said 28 years. Yeah, yeah, 27 or 28. 27 or 28. We're glad 28, she, she, yeah. your bride's not here, so we're right, right, we, we'll just, just, we'll just going to do our best guess. Round about there. <laughs> I'm right behind you. I'm yeah. at 26. Uh. So um, that's an incredible, I mean, one, just like, you know, incredible to model that kind of just long-term faithfulness. Yeah, and uh, and so talk to me about how you guys over that many years and in some pretty difficult yeah. Difficult ministry context. Yeah. Um, how did you guys keep it healthy? Yeah, what kind of learnings did you have along the way? Just stay in a good place as a marriage. I preface what I'm gonna say by saying we've been married for let's say 28 years. Okay, we'll go 28. And 25 <laughs> of them have been amazing. Okay, you know what I'm saying we always we just make that very clear. Yeah, is that we we had a rough 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 start. You know, we both come from extreme backgrounds. Um, was she a therapist already when you got married, or was that let happen later? No, she <laughs> no, she was a therapist, man. She comes from a very rough, rough background. Mm. 
straight up seven mile of Wyoming, Detroit. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? The five people living in a, a two bedroom house. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You can imagine that. Um, and just uh, just just rough upbringing. Wow. Um, and so, <clears throat> so she, uh, she, you know, um, forget the question, bro. Yeah, just uh, how do you guys keep your marriage oh, yeah, so yeah. strong? So, you yeah. have 28 years of uh, it's amazing. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm saying that we, we, we made a decision that we're going to do a couple of things. Um, one is is that we don't take life serious. Mm. You know, uh, we don't take things too serious to, to the point that we just got to completely fall out about them. Mm -hmm. we, 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 that, because we found that that was our original problem. Okay. That so we're just like, are we, are we tripping about the trash right uh -huh. now? And we, now we're talking about divorce. Somehow, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. so why don't we just not take it that serious if it doesn't have to be? Um, we, we and it just, is funny. A lot of marriage fights are over things that are really not that big of a deal. So while some of those you still got to work out, what, you're, what I hear you saying is, hey, let's not make this a bigger deal than it needs to be. Let's keep some perspective here. and We need to assess the severity. Yeah, yeah. Really assess the severity immediately to see is this something – that we need to escalate. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it does need to be escalated, but how we do that. And then th 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 one of the things is that we, we get kicked back on is, is that we chose, um, we chose, it may not be the best decision, but for us it was, because she and I both come from violent backgrounds. And so you don't want to see me, you don't want to see me uh, angry. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and she's not a punk, so she's not going to sit back and deal with that. So what we decided was, what, we, what do we do with our voice, our volume? Hmm. We decided that we're going to bring it all the way down, and we're going to talk to each other. And then what we're, what we're not going to do, we're not going to do those, those kids whose minds are not fully developed, who can't understand that. Because if I, we escalate and we get there, they won't understand the extreme that will come out of both of us. Mm -hmm. So we decided we got a place where we handle this business, and it's called our room. Mm. I would never disrespect you. I would never ever in public. And my son's Lawson right there. He, yeah. he knows. It's like, that'll never, ha he's never seen it. It'll never happen. Because yeah. if we go in, but he knows we also have conflict. Mm -hmm. We take this conflict and we're going to deal with it the way adults should deal with it. And that, that was another, we remove the conflict. Yeah, and that makes we sense. Deal with so it's it. not in front of kids. Did you, did you ever, for the sake of like modeling and whatnot, did mm -hmm. you, did you ever say, hey, we're going to have a little bit of discussion in front of the kids where they would oh. see us disagree, we have see us have some tension? We have discussions all the time, <laughs> discussions. <laughs> yeah, we have we have discussions, and, and everybody's involved. There's no, we don't. There's no secrets. Like literally, so you, you've our, seen some stuff go down. Tank is that is that what we're saying here? Some stuff, but we, when it gets at a certain level, you're like, hey, let's pull back and let's do this. Absolutely, let's go in and be private. Go in yeah, we're going to talk about those things and, and keep our voices low. Keep our voices at a, at a place where we're talking respectful to each other. Yeah. I think the respect is a big thing. It was was the whole overall. Let's respect each other. Um, we don't yeah. need to be disrespectful. I think the last thing I want to say is you know it's, it's sad, but dating like what is that you know and then redefining that as you go as you, uh, as you go we change. Yeah, we used to like to go Goodwill shopping. I can't stand Goodwill now. Right, but that used to be our thing, and then we just just used to go, yeah. and we just do like we're young old people, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> we go good willing, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But that's not our thing anymore. But having the conversation to say, oh, well, what do you like to do now? Yeah. You know, and that kind of thing. But keeping we, you know, we date three, five times a week, so flat just, out. That's, which is a great. I mean, I I've said this to couples for a long time, and uh, back to getting ignored as a pastor. Um, they still ignore me on this, but just the importance of, of date nights, the importance of, it doesn't have to be expensive no. either, but something that is, and I, and I get with babysitting, there are limitations and yeah. different seasons of life. So I understand that, um, that there are challenges, but the idea of figuring out something Some fun for, that you can do together, just connect and be, be mm -hmm. friends and, yeah. and, and yeah, that, find that, that. That's the key. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That, that's what we're looking for. Did, did you guys ever do marriage counseling? Um, we we've had not formal marriage counseling. Okay, we've always had pastors and leaders and mentors that would that when we have some stink mm -hmm. that we can go talk to yeah. and that kind of thing. But we never had a formal, which is weird because he's a counselor. Yeah, but it's cool. I mean, even the step of inviting some people. Oh yes, in. we did. We did. Oh, you did. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Tim and Holland. He was, okay. He, yeah, yeah. So he's he's a blessing to so us. He did a little bit. Yeah, but, but I mean, what's cool is even even with uh, when it comes to inviting friends in or others yeah. in into your story not everybody does that i mean sometimes it's like hey so i've had i've had situations and maybe you have too where you you know people and you think 
I mean, you think you know people, mm. and and you hang out with them and all that, and then all of a sudden you hear, oh yeah, we're thinking we're going to get a divorce. Right? Yeah, yeah, man. Like, what? Oh, wait, 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 where did that even minute. come from? You know, we need we we couldn't talk about this. Yeah, like, exactly. I mean, know, the, where, yeah, where's the yeah, journey here? Absolutely. You know, all that. So yeah. it's cool because even even if it wasn't formal marriage counseling, you were inviting people in. Yeah, which is, man. Which we is a great do. thing. Is, we is that still right? do. We we um, you know, I, it's 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 smaller group now. Yeah. Because the complexity of our lives, mm-hmm. um, a lot won't understand it, mm-hmm. and so it's uh, so what we you know, but people that you know that we we know we got one uh, person and couple, uh, Denny, who's been with us forever. He's like my daddy. He's just been been that step that mm-hmm. both of us can go to, yeah. and just be like he getting on my nerves. Yeah, you know. When you look back, thinking thinking about that question, I was uh, of of having somebody like that. When you look back. Uh, on your journey to this point, and you've had a lot of different voices and influence in, flu- influences in your life. Obviously, uh, your bride is chief amongst them. But yeah. but who else do you think of? And you think you just are you just think I don't know if you have those people that you're like I'm just so filled with gratitude yeah. for that person. Is there is there one or two that come yeah. to mind? I know there's probably lots, and so yeah. the, the risk of naming any is you're like oh if I forget I somebody or whatever. So we know that you can't name everybody, but if there were just a couple you were picking out that you just think yeah, I would say these two in two different. Um, I would say in terms of a person that has been um, a Denny. You know, he's mm-hmm. he's an older older guy I met. And uh, he's just been like a father. Mm-hmm. He has been a father to me. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, literally, he knows he knows everything about me. He mm-hmm. knows, you know, every my credit score. He knows everything, you know, to, to, to really help me walk through whatever that next phase of life is going to be. He foreknows because he's been through it, right? And so he's just, he's been that. I don't, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, the times I want to quit, the times I've, you know, you know, I'm angry. Mm-hmm. I want to do something dumb to somebody. Yeah. You know, he's my second call, and then my first call would would be to this guy named Donnie. Donnie, you know Donnie, like uh, uh, Donnie Bailey, has been has been a lifeline, you know, mm-hmm. um, to to my everything. Um, I remember a particular thing. I um, um, I was molested when I was nine. I think you know that, but um, I didn't talk about it. You know what I'm saying? Until I got I wrote wrote the wrote the book or whatever, and the lady asked me like, "Yo, blah 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 blah," and all that came out, and um, and I vowed to kill the dude, mm. which you know as a kid that's okay, but uh, going through some life changes, and um, it was true. You know what I'm saying? That if I you know if I call him, then I, that's what I wanted to do to him. Um, and I remember sitting at my house, Donnie's over the house, just so I happened to be, this was pastoring, doing, going all over, speaking, and then all that mm-hmm. stuff. I get an inbox, and it's that guy that molested me. Wow. Donnie's there, and I wish I could have this clean, you know what I'm saying? I know you, 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 know, you want me to keep it a buck, man. It's just, I wish I had this clean, spiritual moment. You know, I wanted to call him and tell him to meet me somewhere, and I was going to take, I was going to be the last person he's seen. Mm-hmm. All facts. Facts. Um, but the way Donnie deal with people was that he didn't tell me, like, don't do it. What did he do? He told me, I'm going to ride with you, whatever. But consider this. And he gave me all these things to consider. A table for, <laughs> <laughs> a table for you know what I'm saying? He, Just a little something to think about. The weird thing is that he used to be a gangster disciple. I was yeah. a vice lord. So we come from this. We come from two different worlds where we would have killed each other. Yeah. Facts. And and um, and but him to him. So I knew that he meant. But then the moment I would I would the moment I would have said let's ride, I'm pulling him into something because I know he's not. We no, we're riding. Mm-hmm. And we're gonna find him. And it's done. That's period. I knew that, and then so the, immediately, without him even saying so, I felt the pressure of, oh, this is one person, life of my impact forever if I choose to do this. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And but he gave me the options on the table. But that's how he deals with me in life, challenging. Yeah. But says, I'm alright with you, but you know, and I, yeah. I appreciate those type of people. Well, and he probably knew. I mean, I think that whenever you're trying to build into somebody, you want to build into them according to your best knowledge of their wiring. Right. And if you're by nature a challenger, 
yeah. then the worst thing I can do oh, don't do it. is <laughs> tell you, you know, this is, I can prescribe it, tell you what to yeah. do. I think about my, my uh, youngest yeah. son, who's, who's got a really strong personality, which a strong personality is great when it's harnessed for the right thing. Yes, That's sir. what everybody says. Yeah. Just when it's not, it's a real Straight pain, up. man. It's such oh, a pain. Man. And but he's. Where were you thirty five years ago, man? You could have told me that. <laughs> I wish I well, man. I probably didn't, <laughs> probably didn't know. But he, uh, you know, the, well, like with him, you don't want to just like my wife. She'll tend to prescribe things, mm. you know, and be more direct about yeah. it. And I think she's altered her approach, uh, you, know, you know, now. But but whereas I'm a little bit more roundabout. Let's yeah. ask questions. Yeah. Let's yeah. let's think through it all. Let's yeah. just process that. What are your feelings that are driving this? Mm-hmm. And let try to try to bring him to the point where he's making a good a good decision. Because if I just say, you know, that's dumb, mm-hmm. or you're going to screw up your life if you do that, or whatever, it almost like, well, yeah, who are you to tell me? And right. then he just wants to do it all the more. So, I'm a hybrid of the yeah. two. Yeah, are you? Yeah, I'll start with that's dumb, uh-huh. and then I start asking questions. <laughs> 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 then they know where you stand, at least. Yeah. I, I want to make sure you know that I'm telling you that yeah. this is dumb. Yeah. But, you know, and then I'll go into this. Maybe I got the dining way, kind of, sort of. But. Sounds like both those guys, they were willing to spend time. Yeah. They're willing to um, speak in when they need to, but probably not probably, probably not too fast. They're, they're willing to invest in you. They're yeah. willing to, to, to let you be yeah. f- fully you. In both the, the the proud moments, but also in the, the 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 places that you're like, this isn't what I would put on. T- you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't put on social media necessarily, but it like that you could be your full self in front of them. It sounds like that's what it was a big part of those relationships being being so powerful. Yeah. Would you say that's right? Yeah, that, that, that's that's all true. Um, and I just yeah, I wish I could be as good of a son as he as Denny has been a father, and a good of a brother as Donnie has been to me. Yeah. I, I'm not. I know I failed, but it, you know, even when you Wish. when you say at church, like back when I when I was asking you what brings you the most joy when you were pastoring, and you were saying when an, when somebody who's older or further along is willing to not just be about themselves and their family, mm-hmm. but invest in in the next generation. I mean, really, that's what you experienced. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you're trying to be, and that's yeah, that's what you day. were trying to create a church that would yeah. that would do. So I just I think it's cool to see how those examples no, themselves so are, yeah. are getting passed mm-hmm. down. So you've uh, since pastoring now, you've got a lot of different things going on, and one of them you're repping today with Hustle Pray Eat. Yeah, and uh, just tell me about. I know it's a co ownership of a company, but yeah. what's the what's the backstory? Why are you passionate about it? So um, I, I went on sabbatical. Um, you know, right, right before COVID, and uh, um, and was going through a lot of stuff. You know, just a lot of emotional stuff. <clears throat> and uh, so I, you know, how to try to subscribe you something for sabbatical. I told my board if that's what they want to do, they need to find another pastor. I said I need to be worried about me because mm. I can get all the stuff right for the church. I'm not gonna have these two months. I'm studying something and building something for the church. No, I'm screwed up. Mm-hmm. That I need to get myself strong. So let me find out who I who I am, and let me do that, and that'll be the best thing for the church. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but so I didn't have a a model, a structure for for it. And uh, and my nephew Mark, you know, as, you know, he's DJs for Steven. Yeah. And uh, and he was wearing a shirt. He was living in a house, walking around with it. And I said, Yo, where you get a shirt from? Said, oh, I made it. And just kept on going. Yeah. Like, what do you mean you made it? And he said, yeah, I made it. And, like, and the words just stuck out, you know. And if anybody ever wears Hustle, Pray, Eat, the response you get will be just that. I don't know why. It's like it's the most – no one would talk to you about any shirt more than they will about this shirt. I don't know yeah. what it is. It's just, it's just weird. But uh. the, the three words. But it, it did that for me. Yeah. And so typically when I go into business, um, I'm looking for that feeling of like the, the, is it something there. And then I needed that. Mm-hmm. And one – you know, first thing thing was a need. It, it resolved a problem. And that's the premise of any good business. It resolved a problem mm-hmm. for me. Like, oh, man, this will become my model for my sabbatical. Uh-huh. This is it. So what does it mean to work hard? Yeah. It was not a curse. Um, God designed us to work hard. And then what is work hard, which work hard and work smart, which means to work hard and rest. They go together. Mm-hmm. It's just they work, they go together. And then what does it mean to not be, try to impress people because God is not pressed with our time. He's not confined to time, so he's not impressed with it. So your seven-hour prayer or 90-day prayer, he's not impressed by it, mm-hmm. but he's sincere. 
surrender to him. What does it look like for 24 hours of a, of a lifestyle of surrender? Mm-hmm. Um, what does it look like a life of surrender to him? And that's what we mean by, by prayer lifestyle, seeking God. And then lastly was eat, which is just, it's, it's just a commitment to take care of our family and our community, mind, body, and spirit. Mm-hmm. And he, when he broke it down, none of those exact words, I helped yeah. him to refine those. I was like, I'm in. And then I kind of like, I don't think he could beat me, so I'm just like, yo, I'm, I'm gonna be a partner. Yeah. Said, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I, I, I became the operations person, okay. and he, he runs with the brand. And uh, but God has made it. So I have a t-shirt brand. We always say that this is just a, a flyer. Like God's grace is just. Uh, we've been invited to some pretty ridiculous tables. Oh, is that right? I'll be at the um, National Day of Prayer meeting next week. Okay. Not as Troy Evans speaks. Not as Nitrogen, which are internationally. Ridiculous, but that's also for eat, mm-hmm. right? To talk to their board about what you know, what, how do we view that and that kind of thing. Their, their committee, they have a committee meeting in Vegas. You know, we're invited to to do a launch pitch mm-hmm. along these major organizations that would make an impact, but not as the edge and all this stuff. No, hustle, pray, eat. Yeah, because we have a leadership development, an urban leadership development. Um, our, our tagline is is that we we you know we invest in invest in the brand, invest in urban leaders. We literally we haven't taken a dime in four years. Oh, we invested right? yeah. in urban leaders. We, we we put the money. We give jobs. We train. So we just have. You know, there's about four major urban leadership conferences in the country that are urban specific. Okay, we're one of them. A, a clothing brand. Wow. Right. And uh, and uh, and and to get urban practitioners training that they don't they can't get. Mm-hmm. Very practical. But they leave with strategic plans. Mm-hmm. Learn how to do mission objective strategy tactics. Learn how to do gap analysis. And understanding how to do how to do customer acquisition. Yeah, they learn these things that they'll where they're gonna get that stuff. But yeah. T shirt brand is teaching them. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. That's, that's why I'm that's why I'm locked in. Yeah, that's really, really cool. I didn't know though I mean I knew some of just backstory from just seeing stuff on mm-hmm. the web and stuff like that, but I didn't know the full full backstory. That's amazing. Yes, sir. Have you always had such I mean you've are you just kind of wired to be an entrepreneur by nature? Is that just uh just in you? Yeah, man. I you know, I, I think, you know, you know, I may or may not have uh, been a businessman on the street. <laughs> You know what I'm saying, and uh, and that, but it was just that to me again. I just yeah. feel like that somebody should have seen that. Enough of those were around me to see that that those soft skills mm-hmm. that what it takes. You know, I I just didn't know what return on investment was. Mm-hmm. You know, but I call it the flip, right? Somebody should have translated that, and mm-hmm. I just want to, you know. So I've done that, and so you know, the edge. We've started uh, 17 companies owned by youth and young adults, mm-hmm. and that. And so one of the latest ventures that we have is. So we have uh, my wife and I, when she leads it, I just, I, I do operations again. Um, but uh, we have a, a, a group counseling practice. Okay. So we have 15 therapists. Um, but to, again, a problem, the disparity with people are in the hood specifically and mental health is a thing, you know. So how do you, how do you connect? Mm-hmm. Um, and then most of the time when they walk into places, it doesn't feel like them, doesn't look like them. Mm-hmm. Nobody is talking, it's very clinical. Mm-hmm. And, and last time they went to a clinical place, somebody took their kids. And so it's just like, so how do we create a space, a yeah. place where where that, and, uh, and we've only been running for a year. And we're, you know, God is really blessed. Oh, it's only been going for a year? Yeah. Wow, yeah. I didn't realize that. Mm-hmm. Okay. I was, uh, when I was. A little uh, bit over a year. So when a year I was thinking months. about you guys' unique, unique angle in that way, I was like, man there's some counseling practices that I know of just locally that I think feel that struggle. And yeah. uh, I thought, I thought, man, they've got to connect you guys just Absolutely. from like a referral basis and whatnot, yeah. because uh, it, it feels like it would be a great, great partnership. Yeah. It's cool to, cool to hear you guys doing so well with that. Is there anything else you feel like you'd like to just share with uh, folks today? Anything else on your mind or heart? Um, I would just say like to, you know, um, with, you know, people that would like to, Get into ministry, you know, um, specifically church planting, mm-hmm. that we have a leadership shortage. And I would talk to the existing church, and I would talk to those that would like to, those that would like to get into to ministry. And I was, right now, I'll say specifically urban ministry, mm-hmm. is that um, we need you. Uh, I work with, you know, to my other the organization called Nitrogen, work with denominations from here to England. And doing developing urban church planning networks, and uh, I have churches of every size, from fifteen thousand to five people, and I'm sitting in front of them. And the leadership pipeline for urban practitioners is slim. And if if you have a call and a desire to work in a space, you know, I would love to talk to you 
or reach out to somebody mm-hmm. and let make it be known. To existing ministries, it's just like please get a residency mm. program. Not not these make I can't stand the word internships. Stop making these cats these well capable young people. Stop making them lick envelopes, yo. If they can carry a gun and go fight for our country, then why can't they lead in local church? Mm -hmm. Because we suck at boot camp and we suck at ongoing training. Mm -hmm. We're really good at recruiting. You know, get them to the altar. But let's get it. Let's get. Let's get. But we need more. We need more residencies that are, that where there's loving people where they can load, and then res- yeah. residencies that are okay. We're releasing them yeah. and say, please go. Right. Please go. Go. You know, to do do that. That's what. We, that's 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 my only. That, that would be my cry. Yeah, that's a good word. Is it, it? Would it still be your perception? I've heard it said by by some, and I don't know if this would be your perspective, but some would say the biggest crisis from a church multiplication standpoint these days is actually. Not financial. It's in leadership. Facts. That that the the, fi- the finances can be found or Facts. out there, and it's having quality leaders that really is where the biggest gap is. Bro, yeah. I just did a research with the, with the denomination, really to assess how they're doing with the urban um, ministry and church planting. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so I had a bunch of questions, fourteen questions, uh, 11, 11 regions around the country. Um, I don't know, a couple thousand churches represented in that or something. And I and I asked him some questions. Yeah. And I, when I got down to you know, do you want? Did you have a? Do you have you been dreaming about our urban center where you would like to plant? Mm. And I think this is beyond urban. I think it's in general. But uh, do you have an urban center where you would like to plant? And every every everyone they were passionate. They could name the place. They could tell. You know, they, they had it was deeper than oh yeah, yeah. just go to Wyoming. Or, no, no, it was they had a deep deep. So that, it wasn't like a. Desire. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have a vision? So they knew where they could mm-hmm. tell me where they could pinpoint exactly where. So it wasn't like like a, a destination and all that kind of stuff. It it wasn't about money. It said we half of them said we got money. Uh-huh. And the other one said we'll find the money. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't about the money. To your point, it, every one of them, eleven district superintendents, all of them said we don't have people, Troy, or yeah. and or I would say majority of them said and, and we don't know how to do. Church planting in the urban context, mm-hmm. and so I, I, I think, I think to your point, I think it's the um, Microsoft. You know, so uh, you know, Microsoft they trained us in a specific s- system, and it's been drilled, it's drilled in my brain was people, process, then implementation. Mm-hmm. Most humans, what we do is we people, then we jump to implementation, just doing stuff. Mm-hmm. But we need to spend more time in that, in that, in that, in that process part. But then I think here we're ta- we're looking at a people shortage. You can't even get to the system. John Cotter's, right? John Cotter's change, um, change management. You yeah. start with getting a gathering group. That's the mm-hmm. first step of change management. Or, or no, first step is, is recognize that there's a problem. The iceberg is melting. And then you go to get a gathering group. Get a group of people. What if you can't get the group of people? Yeah. And that's where, we're, that's, that's where I'm just, yeah. you just running that's my belt. A, well, and I, what I love about y- what you're doing now is really trying to come alongside anybody who's got interest, and yeah. particularly when it comes to urban church planning and saying, what can you do to help? I would love for more, ch- I mean, that's a, the fact that the group you are in had such a heart for church planning is itself amazing. Not, that's not always the case, and I wish mm-hmm. and, and hope for uh, more churches to just get excited about yeah. the idea of multiplication. Uh, we were just talking to somebody the other day, I w- they were saying that they they uh, were part of a church that was well known, you know, prospering, all mm. that stuff, and they said their whole ministry experience in that church, the idea that like the mission field could be out there, and we would want to send people, and mm. we would want a church plant. They literally had never heard that idea before. For them and for that church, which again I respect that church in so yeah, many different absolutely. ways. I'm not going to even mention its name. Yeah. But they were doing great stuff, but yeah. they were always like, the mission's right here, the mission's right here. Mm. And it was all about, we, we're building this church. And, um, and I just think, I think that's, of course, we want our churches to Absolutely. thrive. Of course, Absolutely. we want them to reach more of the community yeah. and all that. But I'll tell you that the thing that, and we just passed this threshold uh, the, uh, this, this year for the first time. For this, this year, every year, you know, we invest substantially in church plants. And this year is the first year that the churches that we've helped plant mm-hmm. are actually like their their Sunday attendance is actually greater than what our church is. Let's go. And I was I saw oh, that man. and I, I finally I've been wondering that forever. So I, I I like reached out to everybody. I got their numbers and I was like, man, 
That yeah, feels man. so good. I celebrate that. Like yeah, I hope man. they're fifteen Jeez. times the size of a Getty. Absolutely. But, uh, I thought this is this is a good day. So uh-huh. and I hope that continues. We're still learning. I don't. We, yeah, you know, we're yeah. Far from having it figured out. And I got. Oh, that's amazing. Tons man. of dreams and hopes for the future. Yeah. So I don't want to come off like we're we're you know we're the experts or something. But you've been consistent. I've been consistent, and I feel like um, to see that you know to see that reality of mm-hmm. like wow. Those, I add up all those different churches that yeah. are reaching more people because that really is the heart of multiplication. I, I get I get where people want to kind of focus on their own thing. That's a temptation for me too. You yeah, know what? Man. If we had all the resources for like just for our staff <sighs> and hiring more people and buying yeah, stuff man. and all that, that's great. I'd love yeah. it. But um, but the reality is the kingdom of God and the biblical model is church multiplication. Yeah. That means we got to hold loose loosely with leaders. We got to hold loosely with our finance. We got to invest them, send them out. So yep. thank you for your example in doing that. Oh, thank no, you for man. what you're doing to multiply churches and, and, uh, and to encourage young leaders who are trying to figure it out. And they got a, they got a passion and they got a heart for, for what it could look like, but they're like, I don't know what the actual steps are in the process. And, yeah, I just appreciate your years of faithfulness in so many you, so brother. many appreciate ways. Thanks for being a huge encouragement, and uh, I hope that many uh, others will hopefully. I'm, I'm going to pray that God would actually raise up some people. They're going to hear this uh, conversation, and they're going to send something in their own heart. It's time to take a move. So, yes, awesome. Thanks for being here, Troy. Right. Good to be here, brother. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Troy Evans, and it has been so fun to see over so many years Troy's faithfulness, and that is one of the, the great encouragements and challenges that his life Uh, speaks into my life is just what it means to keep going faithfully in the same direction, building into people and believing in people. That really is the heart of this whole podcast. So hope you were encouraged. Uh, If you did enjoy this episode, I want to encourage you to rate and review us. That helps us get the word out about Made to Advance. And uh, I want you to know this has been a product of Engedi Church. And so we've got some incredible conversations on the way. But until next time, just know you were made to advance.